it's an absolute pleasure to follow the very impressive work that the Falls team are putting together. And I think um, I don't know how this is going to go, but I, I think we should we should all probably think about these uh, programs as sharing a lot of information. Um, I, I I've been reflecting that maybe. Um, the fall, we, we could call it the false program, but maybe it is just deterioration from a standing height. Um, and but actually, maybe in the same way, our program in deteriorating patient is a physiological fall, often with harm. Okay. So um, what I'd uh, like to do is really kind of talk to you a bit about the deteriorating patient program and just flesh out a bit more what Claire mentioned when she uh, was giving the. Um, the opening talk about what we are doing um, a, in Scotland to try and reduce cardiac arrest in our wards, which, as has been alluded to, be really by all the speakers that we're working in a very uh, uh, challenging environment at the moment. We all know that when we're doing our frontline clinical work. Um, I'm going to touch a bit more about the importance of measurement. Um, as we heard from Joe, measurement is key to all of our SPSP programmes. And that has been a, a, an area of challenge within the DEPAT work. I'm going to unpack a bit more the uh, uh, the way we've been trying to map the, uh, our response to the patients who are deteriorating with the structured response tool that we've developed and was launched this time last year. And I'll end by just giving you a, a, a bit of a heads up with uh, regard to the new sign guideline update. Uh, the consultation was open, it is now closed. I can't give you all the information I'd like to, but I'll certainly signpost you what is going to be in that guideline and what's going to be new in that guideline. So thinking about cardiac arrest data, um, I, I'd like to talk to you about um, work we did towards the end of last year, really led by my colleague in the improvement team, uh, Megan Bateson. Uh, many of you will know that um, since SPSP started, we've looked at uh, cardiac arrest reduction on our wards as the main metric to show that we are improving the management of the deteriorating patient. And as you'll know, uh, when uh, we've done this work pre-pandemic, we had about 17 hospitals um, across Scotland inputting data into the national data. It is fantastic that as we stand here now, pretty much the whole of Scotland is inputting data into cardiac arrest um, uh, data for, for SPSP, and that is very impressive. But what we found as the program's gone through is that particularly with that flux of the pandemic, changes in staff, frontline clinical staff, but also QI staff within your boards, is reliability of data was a key thing. And one of the things we've really been focusing on in the past year and month is getting that reliability of data. And that is clearly one of the reasons where we, we, we haven't seen uh, a kind of huge reductions in cardiac arrest across across Scotland. Clearly that is it, it, it may well be due to the, the how hot the system is running at, at the moment. But uh, we are on a journey to improve the reliability of that data. Uh, uh, Megan and colleagues met with uh, teams across 10 boards uh, last year and found that six are pretty reliable processes. But we unpicked with those boards exactly how they were recording cardiac arrests how they're logging calls, how, the, how they were describing those cardiac arrests, and then how they were doing their cardiac arrest reviews. And we have resources on the SPSP website to, and, and Teams channel to um, signpost you to um, if you want to kind of take that, that learning through uh, in your own board. Um, and a lot of learning came out about that. You're going to hear in our breakout session later on this afternoon about the work from NHS Lanarkshire using, uh, using Datex to log cardiac arrest calls, but there are other systems, and it's about the system that works for you within your own organization. A key theme was having a, 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 a person within your organization that, that owns that data and starts to spread the learning when those events happen. And we know for many of you, that is your resource officers. They have that link between maybe the QI team, but also the frontline clinical team and their constant staff. So they, they appeared key. But the other thing is taking that more detailed learning, your cardiac arrest reviews, and ensuring that that is embedded with your own board's quality management system. That the learning of an individual cardiac arrest is fed back to the frontline clinical team, but also up the management chain. Really basic stuff. The fact that the named consultant of that patient knows that patient had a cardiac arrest. And that is a challenge to us that we face because of the way we work these days. Um, 
I want to talk a bit more about the principles of structured response. Again, we launched this at this event last year. Having a structured response to deterioration is something we've been challenged with um, in NHS Scotland for a, for a long time. Um, we're going to hear from uh, uh, colleagues in, uh, elsewhere in the UK about how they've done that, but we need that structure in terms of assessing how, how um, patients are deteriorating and our response to deterioration. When we launched the principles of structured response last year, um, we, we uh, launched other associated documents, a mapping tool, so you can use those principles, not to create a one pro forma of to manage deterioration in Scotland, but look at the way you do it in your own local areas and adapt and use those principles um, to respond to deterioration. And we launched a mapping tool really nicked from the oil industry, so you can work out um, how, how you actually respond to deterioration in your own area. And that's particularly pertinent because our systems have changed. Our systems now, it is commonplace for our patients to be over 24 hours in an ED. That is not how that system was designed to work. And you need to know from your frontline staff how your system is working now so you can look to improve. And over the past couple of months, we've met in person, uh, as Claire said, seven boards where we've met with key people within those boards from a QI background and a clinical background to show how you can facilitate a mapping session with frontline staff. And these have been really positive sessions. I've done uh, two uh, with teams in my own board in the NHS Lothian. It's a great chance to talk to bedside nurse the nurse specialist, the junior doctor, about how they actually respond to a deterioration episode. We've done these facilitation sessions, as I said, with seven boards, and, and the response has been really positive. I found it very heartening because we're almost uh, inspiring the, the, the next generation of improvers in terms of our frontline staff. But I've also found that we've given confidence to those in a quality improvement space to go back and spread that learning in their own boards um, in terms of how, what's your first thing you're going to start to do to improve deterioration in your own area? And how do you know your own system? Um, just a shout out for our, um, uh, our webinar series of women deteriorating patients. Uh, we do these regularly towards the end of last year. I'm very uh, grateful today to be joined by Gavin Simpson, who's uh, from NHS Fife. And uh, Gav's um, uh, EOB's webinar was very well received last year, and many of you are struggling with the challenges of implementing these new systems. No one in Scotland knows more about it than Gavin. He's doing a, uh, a learning session again this afternoon, and, and there's a lot of information for you there. Our latest webinar uh, went out last month on cardiogenic shock from Alistair Proudfoot in Barts Health in London, and that's really highlighting a particular clinical syndrome. As Claire mentioned, a lot of our focus over the years in DEPAT has been in that, that clinical syndrome of sepsis, but there are other clinical syndromes out there. And particularly as we see higher acuity patients in our hospitals, there are complexities with other clinical syndromes. And we heard about uh, the identification of that deteriorating patient with cardiogenic shock and how we get them to, to the place uh, they need to be. Um, and if you're in doubt of where that place is, it's just across the corridor uh, in, in the hospital over there. And I want to finish by talking about the sign guideline update. So the first sign guideline for deteriorating patients was published in 2014. And my God, a lot has changed since then, hasn't it? But for the, over the past 18 months, we've been working, I've been chairing the group to update this guideline. Again, many of the people who've helped me in that process are in the room, whether it's Eddie or, or, or David, advising us about how to uh, update this guideline that is fit for purpose for the systems we have now. The consultation is closed. I can't give you the guideline now, but I would like to just go over very quickly as we close what it's going to cover. We made a decision that the guideline uh, is bread was going to in increase. It doesn't really matter to a patient where they deteriorate. If they're deteriorating at home, on the way to hospital, or in the emergency department, or in the ward, they want um, a defined standard of care uh, for wherever they deteriorate. So the, the updated guideline will talk to that pre-hospital space, and we have had really excellent engagement with primary health, uh, care clinicians, Scottish Ambulance Service representatives in, in terms of defining the guidelines in, in that space. 
it's no surprise that the, the guideline will comment on the use of EOBs. We know these systems can be effective, but they're bloody expensive. And we and the guideline will hopefully help you in your own organization to find what kind of EOB system is effective and what kind of EOB system you may want to consider for your own area. We know from the pandem pandemic and we know from a lot of the work we've done in the debt app program that planning for deterioration is key. Whether it's the anticipated care plan you may have with your patient in the community or using a treatment escalation plan when they've been admitted to hospital and their, their clinical status is in flux. Um, and again, it, it's absolutely right that that will be uh, front and centre to this guideline using the language we, we use these, these days with appropriate patient involvement. As Claire said, um, the evidence in sepsis has changed. We know the challenges around um, antimicrobial resistance and uh, the guideline will update um, uh, the advice on sepsis uh, using uh, best practice international guidance. We've talked a lot about DEPA and the challenges around uh, the structured response to deterioration. We're hearing from colleagues in NHS England, NHS Wales, um, we don't broadly have critical care outreach in Scotland. But maybe we, that's something we need to think about, particularly as our wards are running hotter and hotter with sicker and sicker patients. Do we need that extra safeguard? The guideline will talk about that. And the other, the other key thing is handover and communication. And we've heard of that in the falls program as well, as we're making those transitions of care, whether it's the patient coming into my ICU, the patient arriving at hospital, or the patient being discharged. The effective handover of information is key, and we'll touch on that in the guideline. So that's to come, and it should be with you in the next couple of weeks. There's a lot there, but I've already said to you that um, uh, there's a lot of learning out there from other parts of the UK. And I'm absolutely delighted uh, to move on and present uh, uh, and introduce our next speaker, speaker Dr. Christian Subi, who is in, very much a uh, a leading light in the work of patient deterioration. Uh, Christian uh, did his training in combinations of areas in uh, Germany, uh, England and Wales, and he works as an acute phys physician in North Wales at this present time. He's got background training in respiratory and fiddle care as well. Um, and I think he, he's also done work for Médecins Sans Frontières. Chris's team, um, as many of you will know, were, were the first to publish um, the evidence around early warning uh, scoring systems that are now commonplace in all our areas. And he's continued to uh, produce uh, research, particularly around early warning systems, but also how we measure improvement and deterioration. And his work has been absolutely key. Um, he uh, continues to host an annual conference, uh, Patient Powered Safety. He's done work for the Health Foundation as well. And I'm absolutely delighted uh, that he can join us here today to talk to us about what for him and, and in his area is the future of patient deterioration work. Over to you, Chris. Thank you. One, one, test, test. Good. Good morning. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. The last time I was in Glasgow it was with the International Forums quite a few years ago now, and we had three days of amazing learning, and I'm really looking forward to joint learning today. Um, I work as an acute physician uh, with background training in respiratory and intensive care medicine. I lecture at Bangor University, and I live on the Isle of Anglesey. Uh, these are my conflicts of interest. The things that people mostly asked me to talk about is about early warning scores. We were the first group who published on this. We didn't invent them, but we provided some of the evidence. And to 2012-13, together with all the secondary care hospitals in Wales, we decided to implement the national early warning score. We actually implemented it in all but one hospital before the official document was out. And we were able to show in the 12 months afterwards that we saw a reduction in cardiac arrest by 30% and a reduction in death from sepsis by 20% in naturally occurring data. So we were able to show that change at system level is possible 
in a disparate, uh, difficult, complex system like NHS Wales is. Today, I want to talk about a couple of other things that are going to need your help. If you could take your device out, your phone, your iPad, your computer, and I, this is going to come up in a moment again. I'm going to ask you to log into menti.com. There's a code number that you need to do, which is 33705803. That's going to come up again. And then I'm going to ask you to collaborate with me on the next 18 minutes or so. I'm going to start with this study from 2009. This is an analysis of the best and the worst hospitals in the US. And they looked particularly at big surgery, so aortic aneurysms, pancreatic surgery, valve replacements, and they compared the best hospitals with the worst hospitals. Now, the mortality in the best hospitals was 3%. The mortality in the worst hospitals was 8%. What was, was astonishing is that the rate of complications between those best and worst hospitals was near identical. So the change in mortality is due to the ability of a team to turn somebody around who's got a complication, what's called failure to rescue. So the range from 7 to 17% is really what makes the difference. Now, where does that come from? And people often say, oh, well, that's, that's the organizational culture. And one of my mentors is John Overdweight, who's a social scientist from Karolinska. And he says, Chris, there's no such thing as culture. There's beliefs and there's behaviors. And so we know that if you change systems, you change some of the behaviors, and that might then affect the beliefs, maybe rather than the other way around. So we need to think about what are the systems that we can change uh, to influence this. So I'm not sure what your hospital is. Are you a high-performing hospital, a really safe hospital, or are you not so safe? Now, this is anonymous, so you can put this up there, and nobody will know who's marked. But I'd be grateful if you could just for a few seconds reflect of what are the behaviors that you're observing in your hospital and where are they? And what do you need to do to change the system so that you're influencing behaviors so you're getting better outcome for this? And thanks for all of you to dial in. And so we can sort of get a theme there. You know, most people are thinking average. And we'll, we might want to analyze why that is. As the, the red thread through this presentation, I want to use a story of a colleague of mine, Helen Huskell, who's a patient safety activist and um, patient advocate for the World Health uh, Organization. And some of you might have heard her story before. On the Thursday in question, Helen dropped her son Lewis off at the hospital. Lewis was 15 years old. He was a superb student. He was highly motivated. He was very sportive, but he had an anatomical defect. He had pectus excavators where the chest goes a bit in so that the lungs can't fully inflate. And doctors had recommended that maybe some surgery should happen to recorrect this. This hospital was the best hospital for this type of surgery in the region. They had a good reputation. But when they arrived, there was a little problem. And I want you to tell me whether you're concerned about this, is there wasn't a bed on the pediatric surgery ward. But they found a bed on the pediatric oncology ward, so that he was admitted, he wanted surgery, the surgery went okay. It took two and a half hours longer than anticipated, but the surgeon was satisfied that the right the treatment had been delivered, and Lewis returned to the ward. Over the next two days, he started to improve. He was needing a, quite a lot of painkillers. He had some non-steroidals. He managed to get slowly out of bed. But on Sunday, things started to change. Helen got worried because there was a new pain. Uh, it was in the epigastrium, and Lewis was starting to look a bit pale and maybe a bit clummy. She really needed somebody to see him, but it was a Sunday and it took her several times to get the nurses to finally call a doctor. And the house officer arrived, he examined, he diagnosed constipation, prescribed an enema and left. The enema was administered and the pain didn't go away. In fact, the pain got worse and worse over the evening. And now Helen was really worried. Lewis was looking poorly. She finally got at eight o'clock in the evening a registrar to come in from the outside. He re-examined, he wrote some notes, he said there's probably an ileus, heart rate 18, you know, we'll just carry on with what we're doing. But at that point in time, in the nursing notes, the heart rate is 126. Are you worried? 
The next morning, the nursing assistants took the vital signs. And the heart rate was 142. They tried to measure the blood pressure. They had difficulty with the machine to get a reading. So they brought another blood pressure machine in. They had difficulties to get the reading. They looked for another blood pressure machine. They had difficulties to get a reading. They took another blood pressure machine. They had difficulties to get a reading. They took another blood pressure machine. Difficulties to get the reading. By the time they got the seventh blood pressure machine, somebody had finally gone to theaters to get the consultant to come. And by the time he arrived, Lewis had suffered a cardiac arrest. And he died just after lunch on that Monday morning. This is a harrowing story. And I've heard Helen tell the story, I've read the story. And it's a harrowing story because there's a young boy who's lost, probably predictable, preventable, if he had a gastric ulcer from the non-steroidals. It's a harrowing story for the family who's losing a loved one. It's a harrowing story for the staff who by now know that they have missed an opportunity. And it's an even more harrowing story because that's the story that comes back again and again and again. And I was giving this lecture at the Patient Safety Congress last year and a father came up to me afterwards and said, this is the story of my son. It's still happening. So we need to think a bit more, you know, what the systems are that allow this to happen and what we change about this. And John Welsh and myself have come up a few years ago with this model where we say, whenever you've got something that's related to risk, this is your model. You need to measure what's safety relevant, record it. Somebody needs to recognize when it becomes abnormal. They need to report it to the person that can do something about it. And they then have to have the right response. But then you need to repeat the whole thing. So if we apply this to this particular story of Helen and her son, they are recording the vital signs. But there is something happening that they don't recognizing that this is a potential life threatening complication. So it's Helen who needs to ask again and again to report this to get this escalated. And then the person that comes and responds is probably too junior. They haven't got the experience. They're not the right person to do this. And even the repeat needs again the patient to come in and advocate. So that's the reason why this whole thing fails. Now, my dad was a mathematician, so I said, look, dad, you know, this is a chain, you know, what is the mathematical model to calculate the reliability of chains? And there is actually formulas for this, but in essence is the chain is as good as its weakest link, right? So now we've built a system that relies on the weakest link, that the person who's taking the vital signs has got enough time to do that. That the person who's meant to recognize this hasn't got another person that's even worse off. That they haven't got stuff that they're worried about at home or other things that take their attention off for just a short period of time. That the person that attends is actually the best trained person for that very job. This doesn't sound a particularly good idea if the system is only as good as the worst person in it. Now, industry has found different ways to think about this quite a few years ago. And the, so, uh, the, 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 the picture model for this is the moon lander from the Apollo 11. It had two computers that were able to independently calculate what was happening. And that's called model of redundancy. Now, all airplanes have got everything that's safety critical in hydraulics and safety critical in electronics in triplicate, triple modular redundancy. The latest generation Airbus has got everything that's safety critical in quadruplicate, quadruple modular redundancy. That's the reason why these things don't come down. If something goes down, one thing goes down, two things goes down, it doesn't matter. The system is completely stable and functional. How do we do this in healthcare? Now, we've done some air experiments about this, thinking about vital signs as a common threat for risk. So trying to think, OK, the person who takes the vital signs puts them on a spot check monitor wirelessly. It goes to a big whiteboard that's setting in the nursing station, and then we can put it on pages to people in the hospital, and we've got some autonomous devices that can measure heart rate and respiratory rate without somebody being uh, at the bedside. And when we do this, we've got modular redundancy. So now the bedside nurse knows what's happening, 
the nurse in the center of the, the ward knows what's happening, but we also got the registrar and the critical care outreach team who are knowing what's happening, that get the alert, that get the information to respond to this. And we were able to show if you do this in a study with four and a half thousand patients, before and after well much groups with severity of illness and case mix, you actually get results. You reduce mortality by 20%, adverse events by 30%, cardiac arrest by 80%, and the people who need intensive care have got a better chance to survive because they don't arrive as ill. So modular redundancy as a system could potentially work in other areas in the same way. And this is the paper that goes with it. The last framework that I want to put on this is around behavior change. And you used some behavior change terminology earlier. You might have seen this model from Susan Mitchie, the behavior change wheel. And basically, they looked at lots of things that change behavior in our personal life, in therapy, in policy. And they realized that there's some common themes, some common threads that link all of those together. The person that changes needs to have capability opportunity and motivation. Capability, opportunity and motivation. It doesn't really matter why we do this. But you know, this is actually not that new because if you watch detective stories, there's always the question, could they have done it? Did they have the motive, the means, the opportunity? It's the same thing. So if we apply this to Helen's story and the deterioration, we've got the healthcare professional. And have they got capability to do this? Well, they've got the knowledge and skills to take vital signs to record them. They've got a paging system or a telephone system to report them. So they probably have got the right capability. How about their opportunity? What is their opportunity to do these things? You need time. And we know that often they haven't got physically the time to do all the things that we want them to do. Hence the challenge, you know, what can we take out of the system to give them the time? But it's also social opportunity. What are the other people in the team thinking when you do this? Now, there's a really interesting twist in Helen's story in that the ward was waiting for a visit of the inspector. So on that day, they are worried about that. The social opportunity is focus on that, not on that one patient and the mum that's coming out. So they might not have had the opportunity to do this. And I'm not doubting that they were motivated. Of course they were. But there was somebody else in the room. There was Lewis. And as many patients, Lewis had somebody with him. He had Helen with him. There is a social network that's around our patients. Now, how about them? Have they got the knowledge? Well, they often know what's good for that one patient, especially in kids and old people, we know how important it is to understand what's normal for that individual. Now, if you would have asked me five years ago, have they got the capability? I would have said, probably no. They don't know how to take a blood pressure. But hang on, guys. This is the year 2023. Everybody's got an eye watch. They can do heart rate, they can do respiratory rate. Everybody since COVID has got a saturation probe. So the capability is changing. And as it does in every area of innovation, it moves from the experts to the professional, to the consumers. It happens in every area of innovation. So the capabilities are changing dramatically. Now opportunities, they're already in the right place. They got time to burn. And they got the social opportunity to ask, and are they motivated? Do you think they're motivated? I want to share with you another story about aviation. We're always amazed how they do it. It's the tech, it's the checklist. Let me tell you a secret. Why does the pilot does the checklist so well? They're going to be on the plane. The pilot doesn't want to die. The pilot doesn't want to die. And that's the reason why they do this so well. But in healthcare, we're not using that. Why are we not using this immense energy to survive that patients and those that are wrapped around them have got? Why are we not exploiting that for system change? Now, you might have been 
in a position where one of your loved ones has been in hospital. Somebody that you were close to, and you might have seen that as an expert in your field, you, that things were not quite as they should have been by the guidelines or the rules. You've been worried about them. You might have said, oh, I've got to ring somebody. I know somebody who works in that unit. I know somebody who works on the next ward. They can just check in on them. Can you just, you know, you don't need to put the names down, but, you know, have you ever done this? Have you ever gone in and oh, I'm just going to pick up the phone? I'm just going to pop in. I'm going to just contact somebody that I know. Now, whenever I do this, most of us have done this, and often multiple times, because we understand the system, we know how to run it. And of course, you are all special. But maybe you are not so special that you're the only people who've got the right to do that. We last Tuesday launched something that's called Call for Concern. It allows patients to activate the critical care outreach team if they're worried about their health. This is based on Helen's work and it's based on Mandy O'Dell's work in Reading, who's been doing this for 10 years, collected lots of data. We piloted it with intensive care patients for a year. So if you came out of intensive care, you were made aware of the service and got access to it. And we just gone live. So patients now can use their capability, their opportunity, their motivation to help us detect those patients that are going under our radar against our best intentions and best wishes. So this is where we are. So failure to rescue is, is not an accident. It's most of the time, as you said, it's not malice. It's not individual failure, but it's system failure. If we think that we can fix this by getting the individual to perform 100% of the time at 100% of their level, then we're not going to win. We need to think how we make the things that are safety critical redundant so that several people can support each other in responses. And then when we're thinking about change, we need to bear in mind that we need to align the capability, the opportunity and the motivation in order to get change and results. And the patient might be our best ally yet to do that. Thank you very much.